the event of the uh, of the past uh, have have highlighted a need for police reform in our country, in our community. Uh, I, our advocates, victims, and their families are, are crying out for accountability, transparency, and changes to improve police policies and build mutual trust and respect between the police and the community, the community and police. I've always said that the two uh, must be on the same page, working together in the interest of our city as a whole. Uh, last year, on June the 10th, if you can recall, we met in this same room uh, the day after the George Floyd's funeral, and I, along with council members, uh, signed Executive Order 1-67 on the use of deadly force in the Houston Police Department, um, banning excessive use of force, uh, banning chokeholds, requiring that officers have a duty to intervene, restricting when officers can shoot at moving vehicles, uh, called for a use of force continuum, requires officers when possible uh, to give verbal warnings before using deadly force, and requires comprehensive use of reporting. Uh, I signed that and many of the members of city council joined me, with me in signing that on June the 10th. I will say that many of these things that we put in place through the executive order, uh, those things are still being debated in Austin at the Capitol or being debated up in D.C. But those things are in effect already in the city of Houston. Uh, the FAT task force um, also indicated that while these measures represented positive steps in the right direction, the department should add the following, and that is a ban on no-knock warrants for non-violent offenses. The existing executive order uh, still allows for no-knock warrants as long as the warrant has been approved in writing by HPD chief of police or his designee, and the warrant has been signed by a district court judge. Today, uh, we are banning no-knock warrants for nonviolent offenses, which is the recommendation of the task force. On June, and I do want to acknowledge also at the offset this task force uh, that was headed by uh, Larry Payne. You're going to be hearing me mention his name several times, along with the members of the task force, the 45 members. So, uh, Larry, at the very beginning, I want to uh, acknowledge and thank you for your incredible, incredible uh, leadership. And uh, I might also add uh, that prior to this, com this uh, press conference on you know, last night, uh, uh, Larry uh, Payne convened, I think it was about 25 or 27, 27 members of the task force where I went over the recommendations of the things, the, the steps we are taking today uh, with that task force and had a very, uh, very enlightening, enlightening conversation uh, with them. On June 24, I then, I then appointed uh, the Mayor's Task Force on Policing Reform, chaired by Larry Payne, and asked members to study Houston Police uh, Department policies and, and procedures. And last September, after shortly thereafter, I assembled the 45-member task force uh, chaired by Larry. The task force uh, presented 104 recommendations. And as I said then and, and since then, I agreed with the overwhelming number of those recommendations. Over the past several months, we have been deliberate and methodical uh, in our approach, which required time, additional study, identifying individuals to hire or appoint uh, to key positions called for in the reforms. And quite frankly, uh, the lack of funding affected the implementation uh, and execution of some of the key recommendations. Uh, today, I am going to announce how we are moving forward to implement additional um, reforms called for by the uh, task force and some of the major proposals, including in the task force recommendation. In a brief summary, in a brief summary, we are changing the Houston Police Department's policy on body-worn cameras. I'm announcing the hiring of a deputy inspector general of the new Office of Policing Reform and Accountability, restructuring of the Independent Police Oversight Board to include appointing a new chair, changing how members of the public can file complaints and access information on a newly designed website with five data dashboards uh, regarding police transparency, 
and a roughly $25 million investment in crisis intervention over three years. The task force recommended that we integrate respectful, consistent, and meaningful community engagement and input into existing work practices, including recruiting, training, patrolling, and promoting. We are expanding community engagement into cadet training, as well as post-training in that first year. Uh, we will continue to partner with Sam Houston State University, but we will broaden our reach to include a partnership with Texas Southern University. And I've had the privilege of talking to President Hewlett already at Texas Southern, and he has graciously agreed to partner with us. And with Prairie View A&M Ruth J. Simmons Center for Race and Justice, to conduct community surveys, use technology to obtain real-time feedback, ask for community input on recruiting materials, uh, and we will publish the findings. All of these recommendations uh, call for uh, come from the task force. We are already utilizing a video circulating using officers, for example, in sororities and fraternities in, our, in order to encourage others to join uh, the Houston Police Force. Uh, in the past, in terms of the application process, uh, we have asked for people's credit scoring. We will no longer be asking for credit scores anymore. Um, and we will continue uh, to hold and expand our PIP meetings. With regards to independent oversight, uh, the task force recommended that we overhaul the current independent police officer board to support a full-time paid administrative and investigative staff accompanied by a diverse civilian board to hold HPD accountable to a higher standard. Uh, today, I am signing an executive order restructuring the board and appointing Steve Ives, the president and chief executive officer of the YMCA of Greater Houston to serve as the independent police oversight chair. Steve and I have had several uh, conversations over the last several weeks uh, about uh, his role in um, serving in this capacity, and, and, and the conversations have been very constructive and productive. And quite frankly, Steve has said it not one time, but several times, Mayor, this is a defining moment in our city, and I am here and ready to serve. And so I want to thank Steve Ives, and you'll be hearing from him shortly. Uh, today, I am appointing the Deputy Inspector General also of the, of the new Office of Police Reform and Accountability. Krista Okorfa is a Harris County Chief Prosecutor currently overseeing felony cases. In that position, she led and supervised investigations and prosecutions and tried numerous jury trials. She also served as a prosecutor in the major narcotics criminal division and as a di diversion program prosecutor. She is a graduate of the University of Texas, undergrad, and a graduate of Thurgood Marshall School of Law of Texas Southern University. Uh, Crystal will have a limited staff to investigate complaints, both internally and externally, and to report to the Inter Police Oversight Board, as well as to the Chief of Police. Additionally, community members, community members uh, will be able and I, let me pause there because I want to thank uh, Ms. Okora for Crystal uh, for also agreeing to serve. And where is she? Right there. For also agreeing, you'll be hearing from her shortly for agreeing to serve. And um, she's had many conversations with, um, with my staff, and I've had a chance to visit with her as well. And uh, and uh, took time to woo her away. Uh, but uh, but we are very appreciative of the fact that she viewed this as a transform transformational moment as well and has agreed to serve in a full-time capacity. In addition, uh, community members will now be able to submit complaints online, and they can also submit complaints to community groups like the NAACP, LULAC, uh, the Anti-Defamation League, the Islamic Society of Greater Houston, the Mayor's Office with People with Disabilities, uh, the Mayor's LGBTQ Task Force, they can, they certainly, uh, and others uh, can accept complaints uh, and then forward them on uh, to the office. The complaint form will be in multiple languages and accessible and quarterly reports as asked for uh, by the task force, recommended by the task force, will also be, uh, be provided. 
And so I'm very appreciative of, 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 of the recommendations coming from uh, the task force and the changes that will be made. And at this time, let me first let me first bring on Crystal Core for uh, who would be the Deputy Inspector General just to introduce herself and to make a few comments. Crystal. Thank you, Mayor Turner. First and foremost, I'd like to thank God. I would also like to thank my amazing support system, my husband, my two sons, and all of my family and friends, without whom support I would not be here today. When I was first considering this position, I thought about the words of my parents when, that they said when I was growing up. They said, time doesn't change things, people change things. With that in mind, I thought about my two sons and the kind of world I'd like to see them grow up in. And I thought about how the change needs to happen. And I knew that I must accept this position to be a part of the change for my home, Houston, Texas. And with that said, I would like to thank all of the people of Houston. I thank you all because during these trying times when so many cities have been divided, Houston has been united. We have been united in our outcry for change and the Office of Policing Reform and Accountability is a direct result of the change the people have asked for. I want actions, not words, to be the hallmark of this office. I want the people to know that I am here and you are come anytime, my door is always open. Thank you guys and I look forward to working with you. Thank, thank you so very much, and uh, we all look forward to working with you. And then the new chair of the Independent Police Oversight Board will be Stephen Ayers, uh, the president of the YMCA. Stephen. I, uh, for the last 25 years, I've been a humble community servant and a CEO of various YMCAs now in four different cities. Along that journey, I've learned that being a CEO of a YMCA isn't just about swim lessons and programs and great facilities. It's about being part of change in community. I didn't know when I came to Houston that I was going to have an opportunity like this. And I have to say, Mr. Mayor, um, I was blown away when I got the call, but I also recognize that you were inviting me further along that journey of self-reflection and understanding and appreciation of what, what my role as a public servant and a community engaged individual and the CEO of a YMCA really meant and was about. I spent some time in consultation with my closest advisors, our board of directors, executive committee at the YMCA and the leadership team with which I work. And at the end of the day, it was unanimous. You know, when I asked the question, Steve, you gotta do this. How can you not do this, Steve? This is the most important thing that's gonna happen in this city and quite frankly, in this country. See, I know a little bit about accountability. I'm a dad, I lead a staff team, and I recognize that good people with good intentions, with a strong system of accountability, just do a better job. And they're happier, and they're more effective, impactful in their, in their work. That goes for the officers who serve on the police force, knowing that they have a system of accountability that rewards those who do it well and holds accountable those who step out of line for a community knowing that that's in place, but also knowing that we have a say in it. So I understand my job to be helping people to understand that we have a say in it, but also figure out how best to engage because keeping our community safe, keeping our community thriving, helping all people feel like they matter and that they can make a contribution is really up to all of us, not up to any one institution. So I'm proud to accept this opportunity to serve. And Mr. Mayor, thank you for uh, blowing my mind and helping me expand my perspective of what it means to be in this role. And I can tell you, as I talk to my colleagues across the country about YMCA work, community engagement work, these are the kinds of things all of us are beginning to lean into. We've learned, especially in the last year, how important we are, how vital we are to the community and what we're going to become in the years ahead. So on behalf of the YMCA Board of Directors, our staff, the members of our YMCA and the community, thank you for the opportunity to be in this role and I look forward to serving. Thank you, Steve. 
The task force recommended a balance of power dynamics between the Houston Police Department and Houstonians by releasing body-worn camera footage of critical incidents in a consistent and timely manner. I will tell you that we will adhere uh, to the recommendations on the release of body-worn cameras that was outlined in recommendations one and two on page 52 of that report. Let me pause now and bring up uh, Chief Troy Fenner. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council Members. If a chief of police or police officers can't listen and hear the citizens and feel their hearts, we're not going to be successful. Thank you, Larry Payne and all of the task force members. This is a great piece of work. And this is the start of much more to come. Thank you for being here. My union president, Doug Griffin, thank you for being here. The mayor said it. We can't just talk transparency and accountability and don't do it. Everywhere I went in this city for the last few weeks, and even when I was executive assistant chief, the one question will come, Chief, what y'all going to do about releasing body-worn cameras? What are y'all going to do about it? When are y'all going to? The mayor has given the marching orders, and I totally agree. 30 days, within 30 days, we're releasing all officer-involved shootings where there is an injury or a death, period, moving forward in my administration. What does that mean, and how should it, it work? Some may ask, you know, why, why does it take so long to release the videos? It's a lot that goes into it. I don't want to release something premature where we don't have all the angles. Uh, if it's a shooting where you have multiple officers that discharge or multiple officers who viewed it and their camera, we have to get all that. We have to go through redactions by law. And there's some incidents by law that we can't release. If it's in a private home, a private space, we have to get the permission from those individuals to release that. So just understand those challenges. But one thing I can pledge to you today, we're releasing it when we can legally re release it. Um, I spoke with our district attorney. She's in agreement with the release, and we are going to release it. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. And, and uh, again, on, in recommendations one and two, uh, we'll implement clear and transparent dis, uh, dissemination and timelines. And the report speaks of 20, with 24 hours of a federal and our state prosecuting authority opens an official investigation into a critical incident. Uh, the HPD should uh, share all BWC footage with the prosecuting authorities within 24 hours and then 30 days in addition to the HPD should publicly release BWC footage of a critical incident, which includes display of excessive force and or death in custody within 30 calendar days. So that's a critical incident or it's in the case of excessive force or a, uh, or a death in custody. Um, and then seven days or, um, or less within 24 hours, the HPD should notify the prosecuting authority seven calendar days prior to releasing the body one camera footage of a critical incident to the public, except when the chief of police determines that pressing circumstances require a shorter time period for release. Again, those are the recommendations of the first one and two recommendations on page 52, and those are the recommendations that we are going to adhere to. Um, in addition to that, um, today we are launching um, the Police Transparency uh, Task Force website. I know a number of council members have participated in, in, in this process. I know the Chair of Public Safety, Homeland Security, Councilmember Pollard and his staff have been integrally involved in this process as well as others. Uh, but we, um, and the, it, it will go live, these dashboards and website of the end of May. Um, this recommendation is included in the Mayor's, ta Mayor's Task Force on Policing Reform. Uh, the website will include an online complaint form and five uh, data dashboards uh, showing key statistics 
about the Houston Police Department, citing release, traffic stops by race, ethnicity and gender, use of force, HPD disciplinary actions, and HPD to diversity, amongst other things. Uh, the online form represents a major leap forward from the current process, and people will be able to begin the complaint process at their convenience and anonymously if they choose. I think we, I think we have a brief presentation on this website and the five dashboards. This video is an overview of the technology initiatives that are part of Mayor Sylvester Turner's Police Transparency Project. For this initial phase of the project, Mayor Turner identified two big areas of focus. The first is an online complaint form. This will give people the ability to begin the complaint process about an HPD officer online. The second are a series of data dashboards that look at police performance. These two areas of focus are rooted in seven recommendations from the Mayor's Task Force on Policing Reform. Let's look at the online complaint process first. Currently, in order to start a complaint, you download a PDF from the Houston Police Department website. This PDF requires a lot of personal information. When it's complete, it's signed and notarized and an investigation can begin. However, this presents a barrier for people who want to start a complaint but aren't ready to provide such detailed information. We've reviewed what other police departments in Texas are doing and identified the most user-friendly processes. Then, we built a new online complaint form that's user-friendly. The complaint form will be available in five languages. It's mobile-ready, and it's accessible to people with visual impairments through screen reading software. The first thing to note about the new online complaint form is that a person can submit an anonymous complaint. Anonymous complaints follow a different procedure than formal complaints. The details of that procedure are provided at the very beginning of the form so the user knows what the next steps might be. The form also collects incident information such as date, time, and location. It also provides the ability to collect more details about the incident. These details are based on yes-no questions such as were you arrested or were you injured? If the answer to any of those questions is yes, then a box appears to collect more information. There is also an option of including witness information, as well as providing photo and video evidence. Under state law, a formal investigation does require a signed and notarized affidavit, but we hope this online form makes it a lot easier for someone to start the process. Next, I'm going to show you five different dashboards related to data about the Houston Police Department. All of these dashboards follow a click anywhere approach, meaning you can click on any bar any chart, any slice of the pie, and it will automatically filter the data. Three of these dashboards are looking outward, measuring HPD's interaction with the community. The other two dashboards are looking inward, exploring HPD disciplinary actions and workforce diversity. Most of these dashboards will be updated once a month, depending on the data source. Each dashboard will provide specific information about the frequency of updates. The Cite and Release dashboard shows encounters and offenses that ended in a citation and no arrest. You can filter by the offense as well as by race and gender. The Traffic Stops dashboard visualizes data that the Houston Police Department reports to the state as part of its racial profiling reporting. This allows you to dig into the reason for the traffic stop, the reason for the search, as well as the results. You can filter by any of these reasons as well as by race, ethnicity, and gender. The Use of Force dashboard also allows you to filter in similar ways. This dashboard provides an overview of Use of Force statistics, and by clicking anywhere you can filter by the reason for the encounter, the outcomes for subject and officer, and the race or gender of the subject or officer involved. The last two dashboards focus on statistics about the Houston Police Department operation. This is the HPD Disciplinary Actions Dashboard. It allows you to filter based on the reason for the discipline, the type of discipline issued, the number of days suspended, and the number of years on the force at the time of suspension. This data provides officer-level details using a de-identified officer number. Finally, the HPD Diversity Dashboard provides a look at the race, ethnicity, and gender breakdown of the Houston Police Department. You can filter by rank, 
And you can also dig into the details to understand diversity statistics based on age and years of service. We'll end by emphasizing that this is a group effort. Thank you to everyone involved in the feedback process. It's the result of recommendations made by the Mayor's Task Force on Policing Reform. All City Council members were invited to participate, and we received valuable input from many of them. Within HITS and HPD, there were several people who went above and beyond to complete a lot of work under very tight deadlines, and it's the result of many people behind the scenes working together. Thank you very, very much. And again, I want to thank uh, the Chair of uh, Homeland Security and Public Safety and Councilmember Pollitt in particular for their work and assistance in getting us to this point. Um, and then um, the Mayor's Task Force on Police Reform, Item 27 spoke to issues at the municipal courts, improve fairness in Houston municipal courts by requiring alternatives to jail time for people who can't afford to pay fines and fees. Along the same time as the task force was working on the reform, the court was working on the vision for a safe harbor court. Now, this court was designed to be in conjunction with the mayor's, uh, um, the mayor's complete community initiative and has answered the objectives of the task force. This court is designed to assist defendants due to financial hardships, medical issues, or any issues arising from COVID-19, or issues of hardship that citizens are experiencing. This was a vital piece of the Mayor's Task Force on Reforms. Judge Elaine Marshall, where, where are you? If you'll just come and tell us exactly where, where we are on that. Um, just want to thank Mayor Turner for his tremendous support in this endeavor. Houston Safe Harbor Court is located at the 1400 Lubbock location. We are open from um, 4 to 9 p.m. Monday through Friday. We will see every citizen who walks through the doors who need the assistance that the mayor just spoke of. We're Houston strong. Things go wrong with Harvey, with COVID. But if there is a situation where you need assistance with um, any of the traffic citations or warrants that are pending against you, please do not hesitate to come into the courtroom. We also have three dedicated judges that will see you every time. There won't be anyone else but those three judges and myself. And the good beauty part of Safe Harbor is that the mayor is allowing us to take it to the communities. So we will be in the city of Houston in different communities at least once a month, coming in so that you feel comfortable to come into your community's center talk to us about what's needed to bring to safe court, and then we will be able to assist you along with the task reform. That was what they asked for. We were working on it together, and we are just waiting for you to come to us so we can help you. Thank you, Judge Marshall. I'm gonna thank you for your incredible uh, leadership on this, uh, on this initiative. Um, so thank you very much. The Task Force on Crisis Intervention the task force recommended that we expand existing partnerships between HPD, mental health professionals, and social service organizations to lighten the load on officers when responding to vulnerable populations, such as those experiencing mental behavioral health crises, domestic violence, human trafficking, homelessness, substance abuse, and others. And quite frankly, we do ask our police officers uh, to do way too much and put them in some very precarious situations where the outcomes sometimes are not positive. And so the recommendation of the task force was to address these vulnerabilities within our system and to make some changes. Um, and so, um, quite frankly, this portion was restricted due to limited funding. And so let me start off by thanking the Biden administration on the American Rescue Plan, uh, because we, uh, my recommendation, my recommendation to the council members is to utilize about $25 million over the next three years to address this portion of the reforms. The, the task force said we, uh, we should expand the crisis case diversion annually uh, to hire additional counselors. Uh, which is currently in part being funded by the Health Department and Harris Center. They put that cost at $272,140 annually. Uh, we will finance this piece and move forward um, for the, over the next, for the next three years, $272,000 and a little bit more annually. The, the uh, task force recommended that we increase the number of mobile crisis outreach teams 
by 18 teams, uh, which, would need, which, would, which means to hire uh, 36 additional clinicians uh, working with our local mental health of, uh, providers uh, in order to address this piece. Uh, the annual cost on this is, ab is about $4.3 million. We will move forward on this item and will cover the cost for the next three years. Uh, the task force recommended that we add 24 additional crisis intervention response uh, 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 teams. Um, that annual cost was something like $8.7 million. We're not in a position to do that completely, but I am moving forward on adding six additional CERT teams. Uh, that would be an annual cost of about $2.4 million. We will do that over the next three years. Uh, and assuming that there are other dollars that come in from other sources, uh, we certainly can beef that portion up. The task force recommends that we implement the clinician officer uh, remote evaluation co core proposal to provide telehealth technology to uh, uh, HPD crisis intervention trained officers on patrol. The annual cost of this piece is about 847875 and we will move forward on this. The critical importance of this piece is that even if there is not a clinician or a counselor riding with those officers and they come up on a certain situation, uh, they can use the telehealth technology to put them in touch with a clinician to get uh, advice or suggestions on how to move forward. And then the crisis and um, the uh, task force recommended uh, the citywide domestic abuse response team with victim advocates and forensic nurse examiners. I might add uh, that uh, we use uh, about $6.2 million on this program of, through CARES funding through the end of December, but the cost of going forward can be anywhere between $800 to $1.2 million annually and I am going to recommend that we move forward on this piece. All in all, on the crisis intervention alone, uh, the investment that we are going to make uh, with council members' approval over three years is a little bit more than $25 million. And the reality is that is not counting, council members, what we did yesterday, where we diverted a number of provided funding working with the county to divert a number of people away from uh, having to interface with police to other areas where they can get the care and the services that they need. Neither does it factor into account, take into account what we are doing this week and over the, today through the weekend, and that's through our Turnaround Houston program, where we are providing 2,000 job opportunities for those people who are hard to employ, of those people who are part of the reentry program, and that's taking place starting today and through the week, providing 2,000 job opportunities. But this is a critical investment in, the, in, in, in helping to build out the ecosystem that will bring about public safety through addressing public health, because quite frankly, public health and public safety are interchangeable, and we cannot uh, expect and ask for police to be the responders in all cases in these matters because, quite frankly, it increases the number of contacts and especially uh, po poses risk, not just to the, the recipient, but to police officers as well. And I think on balance, this will address uh, holistically uh, the needs of the people in our community. You better speak to this piece, and I've asked Dr. Purse over the last uh, several weeks uh, to take the point uh, because this is more in the public health category and so, Dr. Purse, if you'll come to speak to this. Thank you, Mayor. Council members, Chief Finner. Mayor, if you don't mind, I'd like to start off by recognizing Mr. Wayne Young, who's the CEO of the Harris Center, who's with us here today. He was able to find time to come with us. And the Harris Center has been a tremendous partner with the city on many, many projects over the years. So thank you, Mr. Young, for finding the time to come. So we're going to talk about a little bit about mental health and mental illness. And one thing I want to point out is that all of us have issues with depression from time to time or anxiety. Some of us can be a little compulsive. Some of us can be a little bit paranoid. So when we talk about mental health, when I was in medical school, it was explained to me that those who are mentally healthy are people who are able to balance all of those things. They're not people who don't have anxiety and don't have depression. Everybody has. But we have the ability to balance those so that we can function in society. The other thing is that when we talk about mental illness, there's a ter terrible stigma about it in America about mental illness. We need to get away from that. We need to recognize that mental illness 
is an illness very similar to any other illness we think of. And so I want people to, for a moment, take a step back and think about a couple of scenarios. So mental illness sometimes is like an appendicitis. It sort of comes out of nowhere. You didn't expect it. It became an issue. You had to seek help, professional help. That professional help gets you through it. The situation is resolved. And you go for the rest of your life and never have another problem again. Sometimes it's like asthma. It starts off small. It gets worse. You reach out for help. You try some medications. That doesn't work exactly right. You try a different medicine combination. You kind of get things settled down. You control it. And then every once in a while, it gets out of control again. And you need some help. And you get it back under control. But across your life, largely, it's manageable. And then sometimes mental illness can be like cancer. It comes on. It becomes all-consuming. You have lots of help from the healthcare industry. Your family is involved. Your coworkers get involved. You have strong support systems. It can be scary. It can be challenging. It can be complicated. And sometimes we have good outcomes and sometimes we don't have good outcomes. But in many respects, mental illness is just like any other illness. And we need to see it as that. We also need to recognize that it's common. The National Institutes of Health will say that when we talk about any mental illness in any given year, perhaps as many as one in five U.S. adults will have an issue with mental illness. Some are minor, some are more severe. When we look at the ones that are more severe, those that really impact your life and impact your ability to function, the National Alliance on Mental Illness says that that may be up to as much as um, uh, Six percent of people will have a serious mental illness across their lifetime. So that's not uncommon to some of the other diseases I just talked about, including asthma and, and appendicitis and, and cancer. Very, very common, but we stigmatize it. And part of that stigmatization has really hurt us as a nation because we have chronically underfunded, chronic, stabilizing mental health care, which prevents us from theoretically, from getting into the crisis situation. And again, I want to draw your attention to my analogy with, with asthma. With good asthma care, very few people will have their exacerbations. But with inadequate chronic asthma care, they're going to have more exacerbations. And then the other thing that complicates with mental health is that unfortunately, a lot of times, the first responder to a mental health crisis is a police officer. And when we think of law enforcement in America, well, we don't always think of them as a mental health provider and yet they are thrust into that position. So there are a number of things that come together, but the bottom line, what I'd really like to get across to folks is we need to think of mental illness as an illness, and it needs to be approached and treated as such, and we need to make sure that when people get into a crisis that we respond appropriately, and that's a lot of the work has been done to make that more likely to occur. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Purse. Let me bring back uh, Chief Fanner to speak specifically on these programs as well. Thanks again, Mayor. The mayor hit on a lot of programs, and I just want to back up and kind of explain them because a lot of acronyms and a lot of different things are going on. But first of all, thank you again. Uh, thank you for the funding. Police officers should never be left alone to deal with persons suffering from mental illness. It's just not a good end in, in most cases. So thank you all so much for the funding. I want to start with the uh, working with crisis intervention um, requires multiple prong approach. We had a national, nationally recognized programs serving and teaching and sites for enforcement um, around the country. However, there's always room for improvement. Much of this has re required significant funding. To that end, we're grateful again to the mayor for expanding the, the programs. Crisis uh, call diversion program, it's a joint program between the city and Harris County. The calls are diverted by counselors in our emergency communication centers. So a lot of times, an officer or another clinician don't even have to go out. They can handle it over the phone. So that's, that's a great thing. MCOT, mobile crisis outreach teams. It's a mental health team that responds without police officers, just the clinicians. And on those scenes that it's not deemed it's a danger to them. CORE. It's also known as clinician and um, officer remote evaluation program. This is where we're going to take 80 police officers and equip them with um, computers. And they, once they go to the scene, they can talk with the clinician from that scene 
They don't have to uh, bring them out to the scene and they, they can communicate with them and get those uh, consumers the, where, the services that they need. Finally, the CERT team. It is paired with an HPD officer and a clinician. These are the scenes that we, and it might be uh, violence or, or a danger involved, we get that team with the clinician and the police officer, and it's been very, very successful, and thank you for that. The DART uh, domestic violence response team. Uh, we have an officer with also a, a counselor and sometime a, a nurse to get to that scene where this is domestic violence, give that individual some services that they need right away so we can remove them from that um, situation and it saves lives. So thank you for that funding. Thank you. And Wayne, I know I, I, you were not scripted, but um, Harris Center is a key component uh, to all of this. Um, do you want to you want to have some comments? Yeah, that's okay. no? <laughs> now, did I capture it all? Did I capture it? Okay, thank you very much. Let me just say, um, um, from a mental health perspective, um, the task force recommend uh, recommendations will be transformational. But what will even be more transformational is the additional mental health funding from the legislature, from the state, that will get us on the front end. It, this state desperately needs more mental health funding. What we are doing is that we are uh, providing diversion measures um, when people are already in crisis. And we are diverting them uh, um, uh, away, in a sense, from just classifiers, but to clinicians or counselors. But what is, what is, what is needed even more is additional mental health funding for community health um, that will keep people from getting to that crisis phase. And until we, until we do that, you can look at these reforms. But let me just say one of the things that the task force, and I remember, Larry, when we was here before, you said that these recommendations were not just to the city and the police. These were recommendations to the community, to the city as a whole. This is where we are today is not just the fault of the cities or police departments. It's the fault of society that has underinvested in people. And quite frankly, until the state provides significantly more funding for mental and behavioral health, for substance abuse, we are still going to miss the mark, okay? We're gonna miss the mark. And then lastly, we wanna to touch on is the area of training. We've talked about uh, I-67, the executive orders. Uh, we've talked about the uh, Independent Police Oversight Board. Uh, we've talked about uh, uh, calling for to de-escalate, the right to intervene, uh, the right not to shoot at moving vehicles, the right to give uh, where possible a verbal warning uh, before utilizing dead deadly force. All of this, too, becomes a part of the training. And, and I know uh, HPD has been effectively integrating these things into their training. And fortunately, there's a new training facility uh, that has now been built. And I want to thank Tillman Fatina and the HPD Foundation for making that possible. But many of these recommend, uh, things are already being instituted in the training. And let me bring back, Chief, no, I'm working a little bit. Let me bring you back one more time. <laughs> Hey, the challenge is with the mayor, he's so detailed. He take all your speaking points. But <laughs> let me tell you something. The use of force. You can't have use of force and policy changes and you don't change hearts and minds in training. So I'm so glad that the, the task force has hit on some of the things that we need to change, but also that we've doing a lot of things even before that. But we're going to continue to work as a city and do more. Um, in, in the way of, of implicit bias, y'all talked about that in, in the task force. Um, I'm sorry, implicit bias and, and uh, scenario-based training. Also, uh, I'm sorry, crisis intervention. All those kind of trainings are, are in there and, and we're gonna continue to do that and, and continue to make our, our, our city safer because if we don't listen, to what people are telling us, what they need us to do in training, 
it's going to be problematic. So uh, we're going to have all that. And we also, Mayor, we're going to have universities helping us with training, conducting those surveys. And that's a great thing. And, and not only um, one university, universities from all walks of life, uh, historically African-American universities. So uh, we're going to use, uh, we, we have one class, Building Trust and Trauma. Now, that was to look at the deep-rooted racism against law enforcement throughout the years. Not saying that our officers are bad people, but just looking at that, understanding what people go through on both sides. And we started that before the task force. So those are the things that you're going to see at our HPD Academy. And your chief is going to be out there as well, um, making sure that that training and we're doing what we say we can do. My whole executive team we're going to be out there. So thank y'all. I do want to underscore just on like on the community engagement piece. Uh, HCC, Councilmember Cisneros, I believe is already working with HPD, uh, where HPD will be bringing on interns uh, as a part of a workforce study program, not just for the summer, but throughout the entire academic year. So it is really about going beyond with this tree building branches and establishing meaningful relationships uh, within our communities, working with our community colleges, our colleges and universities, our community organizations um, uh, on, on that front. Um, let me just say, uh, um, we would not be at this point in terms of these recommendations without the, the work, the dedication of the mayor's uh, uh, task force on police reform. Uh, and I want to give a great deal of credit to those 45 members who participated. And then I just want to really place a star uh, by Larry Payne, uh, who chaired the, uh, this whole process. And I, I don't think there's anyone better in a position to speak to uh, what we have laid out today and let me just say, this continues to be a work in progress. Uh, it continues to be. But I think when you, when you look at them, I think, uh, uh, Larry, over half of the recommendations that you all have put forth are being, have been, are being, being implemented. And certainly, the, many of the major ones are being implemented. Um, and so um, uh, I want to bring you up, Larry, and you can speak uh, to, to these recommendations. Uh, this is one individual I cannot say enough for. Um, since the recommendations came back in September, uh, Larry has been in my office several times uh, talking about these uh, recommendations and, and the timeline and, and the next steps. Uh, so he has really uh, been on it. And he, uh, I don't think he minds me saying it, and through his own uh, personal challenges, uh, he has stayed very, very focused. And Larry epitomizes the greatness of our city. And that is people going over and above, even sacrifices, sacrificing themselves uh, for, the, for the greater good. And I believe uh, the work that this task force has done uh, will benefit this, this city for years and years to come. And I do believe that what we're happening, what we're doing here, uh, is what well, I do know is taken note by other cities from across the country. As a member of the U.S. Conference of Mayors and soon to be the president of the African American Mayors Association, I know many of those mayors are watching us as we speak uh, right now. But I want to give I want to give a great deal of credit uh, to Larry uh, for just uh, being the sort of leader that was able to bring people together. A very uh, uh, um, uh, diverse group uh, to come up with these recommendations, and I don't think there's a better person to speak to what we are doing today than Larry, Larry Payne. Are you blown away yet? <laughs> you should be. To put together a great recommendation and a great set of recommendations through the task force hard work is one thing. To see those recommendations come into fruition and be implemented is an entirely different situation. To Mayor Turner, to his team, and to his staff, I want to just say thank you for all of our hard work that we've got us this far together in getting to this day 
and it is a wonderful step to see this go forward. So thank you. <laughs> we have come this far by faith and by hope, but a special kind of hope. Hope can be a dream, a nightmare, or a reality. Not just head cognitive hope, I think, I worry, I pray. Not just heart affective hope, I feel bad, sad, I feel the pain. But we have and have had throughout this process behavioral hope. Hope that is achieved through constant, consistent action and behavior. We will now have accountability, the beginning of change. As I mentioned, thank you again to Mayor Turner, to the city council members, to Chief Finner, the task force committee chairs, and the task force itself. And our motto for the task force has always been a safe city for all. If we do not go deep, we will not go far. We are pleased with today's pathways and guideways and guidelines established here today, and we look forward to more to come yet. As Mayor Turner mentioned, we are 50% there or more, particularly tackling and captioning some of the big things, some of the big ticket items within the task force report. Others will come. In a video conference call last evening with the Mayor Turner and the entire task force uh, preceding today's announcement, you could feel from the task force that we've started a movement, a true movement around these issues for change, a true movement for such a time as this, a true movement that understands that we're all in this together as Houstonians. Police reform is society's reform. Police reform is society's reform. Knowing that change never comes at the task, at the speed rather you think it should, but change does come. Change does come, and change will continue to come. For such a time as this calls us to be about systems change, community engagement. He calls all citizens of the city of Houston, the people are the city, to move away from the traditional, not even the transitional, but to the transformative. This is transformative times. This is transformative work. This is transformative of a society, a community, a city. This is something that we're doing not only for us today, for the walking, talking now generation. We're doing it for the future of those yet waiting to be born. Future Houstonians will benefit from all that we're doing here today. That work is critical for, to be ongoing and to be truly transformative. I'll say it again. Police reform is society's reform. From, 19, from 1963, from the words of Mahalia Jackson, to Martin Luther King Jr. standing on the platform. Tell them the dream, Martin. Tell them about the dream. From Rodney King 30 years later, to today's native son, George Floyd, the reality of us living in the George Floyd reality of today. We, the task force, along with you as all the citizens, look forward to the ongoing implementation, transparency, transparency accountability of the task force report. To you, the citizens of Houston, Know that you have a dynamic team working together to ensure that the reforms continue to grow and develop. If you have not read the task force report, if you have not read the task force report, do yourselves a favor. You will be pleased, surprised, and educated to the issues and facts dealing with police reform. This is not a simple process. It is a very in-depth process. It has many arms and many tenants and many places to go to look at it. We did the research, we did the homework, we put it together in a way that everyone could read it, digest it, understand it, because we want everyone involved in this. It is our process. It is this community's process. So we need your help. Chief Fenner has said that he is doing, part, part of his priority goals is developing community trust. Developing community trust. Well, community trust is about building relationships. Relationships that are built, nurtured, and maintained through mutual trust and respect, through mutual trust and respect, because nothing, nothing happens without trust. And so the importance of just doing it is to be developing those relationships with mutual trust and respect. He, as he mentioned, will be reaching out to you. Reach out to him. See something. Say something. Remember, we're all in this together. And I urge you again to get your hands on that task force report. You can go to the City of Houston's website, Boards and Commission, to the link, Task Force Report. What is ahead of us as Houstonians is to be truly, truly the example to the rest of urban cities in this country. This issue that we're dealing with police reform is something that has grasped, that has grasped the nation. It has taken us all into an understanding 
of reflection and meditation and prayer and prayer and trying to figure out what's the next steps. We have a blueprint here in Houston. We have a mayor and council member and police chief dedicated to making it happen. But we need all of you as the citizens of Houston to be part of this process. It is a process of engagement. It is a process of listening and learning together. It is a process of being willing to play our roles and our part. We all have distinct roles and parts to play in making this happen. I know. I feel very strongly about this city. I know we can do it. I know we will do it. Mayor Turner, Chief Fender, we look forward to working with you as we continue to do this very, very important work. Thank you. Again, thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Mental Patel Davis over the office of um, Mayor's Office of Dealing with uh, Human Trafficking and Domestic Abuse. And then I want to thank uh, Lisa Kent over IT as well and her entire team uh, for working uh, with us along the way. And I want to thank all of you, of course, for being present uh, on all sides. Doug, thank you so very, very much. Uh, Bishop Dixon, NAACP, you know, all of the members of the, of the task force. Let me thank all of you who participated on, at any level. And again, I, I, I certainly want to acknowledge uh, these council members here for their active participation. I appreciate you. And um, thank you all so very, very much.